We made this. Hello and welcome to yet another edition of Pick a Disc. I'm your host Matt Latham and this is the podcast where someone picks a disc to talk about for whatever reason they want to. And the guest today is my friend slash fellow co-hosting podcasty person. Words were wrong, in the wrong order as I said them, but you know what? I'm going to just go with it. Mr. Mark Adams, who I've podcasted it with loads on the Shipwrecks and Carmatoes podcast. Um, known for years. He's been on this podcast before, all the way back in 2000, when we talked about the prodigy and the fact of the land, just before the dreaded COVID came along. So, yeah, we have a lot of interesting discussions and tangents to talk about on this, including origin stories. If you ever want a geography lesson about the middle of England, you're going to be in luck. And a bit of talking about accents as well, because so apparently I've got one. And, yeah, when we talk about the <laughs> the origin of that as well, there's, there's, there's quite a lot of like diversion top topics in this, but it's a very good conversation. I can't wait for you to hear it. But before we yow lot do that, don't forget you can follow us on all the different places like Facebook, Instagram, Twitter, under Pick a Disc. And there's also the Discord server that you can find a link to in the show notes. And don't forget, you know, opinion fraud. I don't think I've said that for a while. Uh, but just pretend that we're good and give us five stars. And people might come along and one, be angry at you for lying about how good this podcast is. And two, they might just lie about it as well. So, you know, growth. So, yeah, with all my yapping out of the way, let's go and talk to Mark been really looking forward to this i think it's been a long time coming your second appearance yeah i don't think it was either of our faults really we both were gonna wanted to do it it's just we just haven't yeah yeah i think <clears throat> yeah I'm, I'm gonna blame i'm gonna like allow myself a, a lack of not self-deprecation for once and just say it's because i've been networking with loads of new people so uh, i'm gonna say i'm gonna i'm gonna i'm gonna blame that i'm gonna blame my online <laughs> i would assume that's true <laughs> but um yeah, Mark Adams, friend, boss on another podcast. Um, boss. <laughs> well, one of one of the bosses. Um, no. of <laughs> um, returning for his second appearance on the podcast. How are you doing, Mark? I'm really well, and um, I've picked a good one for you, I think. I was going to say, um, this has been quite interesting to kind of... Uh, kind of research or look into because i discovered something about lo something about a local music scene i never i never uh learned before i say i'm southwest birmingham you're currently manchester but i think we all have proper my, i apologize for the accent going to naturally yeah uh, hold a second so um the proper we're going to sort of proper kind of proper delve towards back home and you're going to go you're going to go south for a bit i'm going to go west a bit I'm going to avoid going back to Warsaw. You probably go through <laughs> Wolverhampton, go through Wolverhampton, and we're probably going to go down to the to the the southern parts of Dudley. Mark. Yeah. So yeah, I mean, I was on the kind of Wolverhampton music scene very briefly uh, before I moved to Manchester in 1997, um, and I think this is kind of a nod to a very happy time. In my youth, really, the the, the the CD that I've chosen. Yeah, so without beating around the bush, Mark, why don't why don't Yao tell all the lovely listeners the disc that Yao picked for us to talk about today? I have picked Construction for the Modern Idiot by The Wonder Stuff. Yeah, um, a band that I didn't realise was from Stourbridge, which is like up the road from where I am now, um, mm. south of Dudley. Um, with like in in the, the heart of what is known as the Black Country, which yep. um, I'm not Dudley, but as um, someone from Warsaw, is the Black Country. Does Black Warsaw country. count as Black Country? It does, doesn't it? Yeah, it's because it's part because it, cause it's 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 Dudley Wolverhampton and Dudley Wolverhampton Warsaw, and I think parts of Sandwell. Mm. I think parts of Sandwell leak over, but I think yeah. So I think there are part. I think Dudley is the one that's probably the heart of the black country with uh yeah i think yeah. i i'm not sure i deliberately picked a black country band for um for it it was more to do with the fact that it was a 
band that I genuinely adored in my youth. And similar to my previous pick when I went for The Fat of the Land, it's from a very kind of formative part of my life. I, I basically... I, I was... <laughs> I was going to pick something more modern, but for a very similar reason to why I picked Fat of the Land, it, it comes with a story and some real kind of nostalgia that makes me all warm and fuzzy inside. <laughs> <laughs> so that, so I'm assuming that's why you picked it then, because it, you've got a, a kind of... <laughs> oh, it, mate, it was a proper fucking top loader. And, oh, it's terrible. <laughs> and, um, yeah, <laughs> but it was my birthday gift that year, and I was absolutely over the moon with it. And it was, um, I remember it was because I got that because I'd already got one of those, you know, those hi fi systems that were look, looks like they're stacks, but they didn't. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I'd already got one of those, but it was only a radio, a double tape, and a record player. So I remember getting this CD player vividly. Because it was like I'd got the new technology. I guess it was like getting the next uh, generation of video game console as well for me. Because I'd got no way to play CDs up until this point. So I got that. And the first CD single I bought was On the Ropes by The Wonder Stuff. Mm -hmm. And the first album I bought was Construction for the Modern Idiot that featured On the Ropes by The Wonder Stuff. And it just, I don't know, it just reminded me of a time in my life when... Um, my music wound up my mum and <laughs> uh, and um, it, I'd like really kind of discovering who I was and getting into music and kind of just so if you, the, the previous one I picked was 1997 when I'd found my music taste and I feel like this one is a pick that was when I was starting to find my music take taste and i was into bands like the levelers and the wonder stuff and ned's atomic dustbin pop will eat itself and other bands like that and you could see the kind of transition through bands like like say, let's say from kingmaker through pop will eat itself to the prodigy that's then progressed further on to my um early thousands interest in industrial metal, which has now progressed in my forties to weird synthy shit. <laughs> and you can, s it, it just felt like a, a stage of yeah. my music taste that the almost like the first stage beyond listening to what my parents listening to, li were listening to, um, which <laughs> in around 1990 was Michael Jackson and Gloria Estefan. I still listen to both of those artists on the reg. And it just felt like it was a specific moment in time, getting that CD player, getting that new format. And when I was formulating my music mm. taste, it just felt like the right choice. A slight kind of tangent. But as you was talking, I was trying to remember what my first kind of album that I bought or single that I bought. I remember mm. getting, I remember, um, I think it was 96 that I got my CD player for Christmas and I had, I had So Good by Boy's Own single nice. as, a Chris, as a Christmas gift, which to this day, I don't know because I, I don't know why they bought it. Um, and I'm pretty sure, and I think the other one was Blur the Universal. Um, a bit more credible. Yeah. To the point, to the point. <laughs> At, to the point, I, I don't, and I don't know why, another slight tangent, but for some reason, I kind of want the Universal played at my funeral, and I've never known why. I don't know, it, just seem, it just seems a funeral song for me. I mean, I used to do a podcast where people would pick what music they would have for their funeral. I don't, yeah. You didn't come on, did you? No, no, I didn't. It was uh, like last chance, yeah. Maybe we should do a special. <laughs> no. But um yeah, I've, I've obviously picked what music I would like for my funeral and unfortunately it isn't this. Uh -huh. Um in fact looking at it the the choices I made were really really different to this. But then again that's because like I've touched on my music taste has very kind of very much kind of evolved over the years and I have like what I'm mainly into but everything I've previously liked I haven't turned away from. I still listen to Construction for the Modern Idiot a lot. It's just I wouldn't listen to the modern equivalent of the Wonder Stuff anymore. I'd listen to some weird ass synthy shit like The Birthday Massacre or um, 
Dance with the Dead or Beast in Black or something like that if I was mm. discovering new music. But I absolutely listened to what I was listening to in the 90s, just not what might be the equivalent now i mean uh, what would you say would be the equivalent of the wonder stuff now like a, a truly indie with their own record label kind of but indie with a small eye sounding band who would that be i don't know coldplay i don't fucking know oh no um i'm not sure with their own label not necessarily but you understand what i mean like truly kind of fit the indie with a capital I brand this is a question I should know the answer to and it's pissing me off that I can't answer it mm. yeah that's yeah that's a good question there are there are some I can't think of anyone that kind of like have full on brass kind of full on brass or kind of instrumental stuff which I don't want to say Los Camasinos because that's my default to go but I think there are I think they are <laughs> From the sounds of it, planning to release more stuff on their own again, and they've got mm. they've had all sorts of weird combinations of music showing on. But I don't, I don't want to kind of make that my default because it's it's just a case of oh god, Matt's mentioned Los Camasinos again. I have been meaning of... to listen to them because of you, but I haven't. Yeah. <laughs> you might do one day, and again, depending on which album, you might go in. Oh, this is all right. Thinking, what the fuck's this? Uh, depending mm. on which album, but um, yeah, and. Going all the way back, I think the first album that I think I might have either bought, which is either Christmas, it was either History by Michael Jackson. The Good two choice. CD I one. had that on CD, yeah. Yeah, yeah. And I think the first single that I remember buying is, and as much as much as it's probably quite, the views on the artist in question might be uh, debatable. Well, you didn't know at the time. Yeah, uh, was. And I still think the song is great. Uh, Return of the Mac by Mark Morrison. 100% pure dance banger. You yeah. cannot deny that that is the kind of song that will get mom, son, and grandson on the dance floor at the same time. It is yeah. a perfect family party song. It's a shame that Mark Morrison is a bit of a knob. <laughs> yes. Uh, yeah. My, uh, so I've got a lovely little thing with... Now, it depends on how you phrase it. And I can legitimately say... Listen to the phraseology. My first record that I ever bought was Smells Like Teen Spirit by The Wonder Stuff. That is 100% true. My Smells first like record. Teen Spirit by The Wonder Stuff. Bollocks. My first record. <laughs> I'll start again, shall I? Edit me out. Don't make me sound like a twat. No, I'm keeping this I'll in. I'll put that at the end. I'll put that at the end. My first record was. My first record was. Smells Like Teen Spirit by Nirvana. Now, explicitly, my first record. There's no lies there. That is 100% true. Because the first vinyl that I ever bought, and I'm using the word record to describe that, was indeed Smells Like Teen Spirit by Nirvana. But it wasn't the first music I ever bought. <laughs> the first tape single that I ever bought was Donald, where your, was Donald Where's Your Choosers, which is a little bit less credible. I don't know what that is. Do I know? Um, it's a truly terrible novelty song. It's a bit like Shut Up Your Face. Very stereotypical song about being Scottish rather than Italian for Shut Up Your Face. It's terrible. Absolutely, unforgivably bad. Okay, if we, if we, if we, if we're going to go that far, the first I think the first music that I bought I think was a cassette single. Yeah, it, me too. It was around Christmas. I think I was around seven or eight. I think I was eight because I think it was around about nineteen ninety three, and it became Christmas number one. Was it Mister Blobby? Yes. <laughs> <laughs> and do you know what I do you know what I I don't dislike that sing I, I kind of will defend that song <laughs> I think purely Didn't because did he do an album the, as well did he if I think if there's an album you have to have that as a map pick oh god I need to find <laughs> oh my god I need to find that <laughs> I'm pretty sure there was an album Mr. Blobby the album 94 
There we go. <laughs> <laughs> wow. Um, Is it on Spotify? <laughs> it's <laughs> you can buy it on Amazon for thirty eight pound nine p. Thirty eight quid. Fucking eh. Right, I'm looking it up on Spotify. I don't think it is. No, uh, uh, no, there isn't. I, there isn't. But it's you know. Not. But Mr. Blobby, the album, uh, is he's on YouTube and it's fifty nine minutes long. God, it's going to be diabolical, isn't it? Like, I never, ha- I never listened to it. But there we go. <laughs> But, yeah, but yeah, yeah, so yeah, yeah, this this was another first for me, in as much as it was the first album I bought on on CD. CD. And I guess, at least for me, the term disc, when you use pick a disc, it doesn't make me think of vinyl. Mm-hmm. It makes me think of a compact disc. So that's why I chose it. Long story short, with many many tangents. <laughs> but no, I, I'm a tangent friendly podcast. But, um, Clearly, and tan- yeah, but then again, it's still kind, of, still kind of relevant because it's down, it's it's all down to first and stuff. And um, I'm going to close the tab with the Mr. Blobby album before I do something stupid. Um, <laughs> so um, I don't want to host the map pick of Mr. Blobby the album. <laughs> if anyone does, please let me know. <laughs> If anyone's a sycophant enough to want to do that, please let me. Th- Man. Um, but yeah, on the ropes, as we need to talk about on the ropes, I've got the official charts website up for the Pain mm. of the Wonder stuff. And on the ropes, the EP, I think, was um, number 10, got to number 10 in the charts. Yeah, I think it was their most successful single, if I remember rightly. Other than Dizzy with uh, Vic Reeves, obviously. I was, oh, okay. I didn't. So they, were they the backing band for that? The backing band, you can sod off. He joined them. Okay. It was Vic Reeves and the Wonder Stuff that did the cover of Dizzy. Oh, I and did not know that. Oh, wow. Yeah, that was that was their only number one. But I'm pretty sure On the Ropes was their best without a gimmick like that. Uh, from the looks of it, no, actually, it wasn't. Um, Size of a Cow got to number five. Okay. Got to number five. Uh, Full of Life, Happy Now, I think, was released in that November, and that got to 28. Right. Yeah, that was released post-October when Construction for the Modern Idiot was released. On the yeah. Ropes was the single to launch uh, Construction. Yeah. And I, I, didn't, I, did, I didn't know that Size of the Cow did so well, but that doesn't surprise me because that is, without Vic Reeves, probably their most famous track, thinking about it. I don't know it off the top of my head. So, because again, it's, I didn't. It's a song that, uh, at least I was told, is about Margaret Thatcher. Okay. And, um, oh wow, look at me now! I'm burning up my problems to the size of a cow. Is the um, is the kind of like sing along chorus, um, and it was very famous, but it was always in the shadow of Dizzy, which I thought was a shame because. If you mention the Wonder Stuff, people go, oh, they did Dizzy. And I'm like, fuck off. They did a hundred great songs rather than a cover. Okay, I, I didn't realise that. Cause I was, cause my knowledge of the Wonder Stuff is very, very limited. Um, like, I'm genuinely surprised by that because I've like seen previous episodes where you've listened to contemporaries of the Wonder Stuff. See, yeah, now this is quite interesting. So the, um, as my Spotify is suddenly frozen. <laughs> I, there are a name that I know knew, and mm. kind of knew they were localish, but they then didn't realise that how local they were in terms of the fact that they're from Stow, they're from uh, Stowbridge, which yeah, if anyone doesn't know, it's it is just like South of Dudley. Um, <laughs> For people yeah. that are, aren't completely au fait with the terrible accent of our youths, Dudley is a particularly broad black country pronunciation of Dudley. <laughs> it is, yes. Yeah, and if anyone, if anyone's listening going, what, what we're talking about, the black country, the black country is the... It's not an official, not an official term, but it's a kind of informal, yet very popular... Yeah, it's never been like an official region or a county or anything like that, has it? It's just kind of like a formulation of... 
quite industrial towns that were traditionally yeah. during the industrial revolution the the vast majority of any british chains were mm-hmm. made in the area that you and i grew up in yeah uh particularly where i was from warsaw was very known for creating leather um mm. but they, there was yeah so like so i think again sandwell warsaw wolverhampton and dudley were um they were very they were, they were like the industrial heart of the uk uk and you'll see a lot and when they say birmingham has a lot of canals a lot of the canals used to go through dudley wolverhampton and warsaw and these yeah. these to transport all that into birmingham but and the name black country comes from just particularly the amount of smoke that the factories yeah. used to do it used to cover like the whole skies so they just so they used to call it the black country because of how dark the smoke was like the folk from the black country the naming of the black country is pretty fucking literal yeah. And, um, you know, I, I I am Mancunian. I don't sound like one, but I've spent my entire adult life living in Manchester. But I'm proud of where I'm from and where I grew up. And I think part of that is the black country values, the working class values that I've bought with me and kind of amalgamated with the areas of Manchester that I live in. The kind of people that I like, the kind of people that I get on with are working class folk that give a shit. And I've found people like that and communities like that in Manchester. But I brought those values with me already when I moved here when I was 18. So, yeah, I think it does formulate where I'm from, does from formulate a significant part of who I am, even though I would now describe myself as Mancunian rather than from the black country, really. So um, has, has anyone ever said, anyone asked you where you're from because of your accent still? Because I still think your your accent still has very much its roots around black country it does but what's really peculiar about my accent and it's always really helped me in i do a lot of presentation work regardless of whether it's in the wrestling industry or as a celebrant which is my business but i worked for a school of languages for a long time and during that period of time i worked in the efl section english as a foreign language And when you're talking to people who English isn't their first language, something that really helps them is if you ever so slightly overpronounce everything that you say. Mm -hmm. And the black country accent is the exact opposite of that. (laughs) We slur and it's like it all becomes kind of one sludgy sentence with no spaces. And I'm found that... There is no one that quite sounds like me because I'm a black country accent because I have a black country accent that is overpronounced because Mm -hmm. of that particular job. So, yes, people spot the black countryness. I don't know why I've never incorporated any Mancunianisms into the way I talk, but I don't really think there is. Maybe the odd word rather than pronunciations, maybe. But. I don't quite sound like I'm from the black country either because of the overpronunciation thing. Then then again that might be, then again it might be just cuz I'm cuz I spent like 30 odd years in Warsaw and I'm like been in Birmingham but then there's a, there's a bit of crossover between the mm. Brummy the Brummy but the Brum, Brummy's not as broad as black country and I I got people I get people even though, even though I'm like what 20 miles south Mm. Where I where I used to live, I'll get people saying, "Oh, I'm detecting a bit of black country in your accents." Yeah, yeah, right. And I'm like, and I'm like, how the hell can you even tell that? But I, but then again, to my ears, you seem very much like I can pick up a lot more of the the black country. It's it's difficult to shed, and I don't think I need to or want to. And hmm. I guess it's a cliche, but you can take the boy out of the black country, but you can't take the black country out of the boy. Mm, yeah, indeed. Exactly with that, and and there's there's quite of like of in kind of in that kind of talk like a, a kind of like common kind of genealogy stuff. I'm surprised. I'm actually quite generally surprised that of of quite a few bands of this era that came from Stowbridge of all places. So you've got the Wonder Stuff, um, Pop Will Eat Itself, um, and uh, there's another one, Led Atomic Dustbin. See the ones I mentioned. Yeah. So, was you were you aware that they were kind of local to you when you were younger? Yes, or? yes, I was. And um, I think there was kind of a real the feeling of people that are like us 
are this cool was really, really important to my friendship group at the time. We were all kind of like little indie kids growing up. You know, we'd wear our uh, T-shirts over long sleeve T-shirts and uh, baggy jeans. And um, yeah, we I think we all engaged with bands like those three that you mentioned, not just because the music was great, but because it was by people who were, what, 10 years older than us who were unfathomably cool and famous as fuck and they were from shit little black country town and yeah there was definitely an element of that for us we did listen to stuff like i don't know maybe a little bit later stuff like space and other liverpudlian bands as well as mancunian stuff like the stone roses but i remember feeling like the wonder stuff neds and uh, Populate itself were the best and the most famous, even though they probably weren't compared to something like Stone Roses, you know? Yeah, I think, yeah, it's quite, I do quite like kind of, it's a nice surprise or like, oh, I didn't realize they were that local. I mean, um, case in point, when my friend Addis came on to talk about Dexys, mm. and, and, De- and to this day, where Dex- Dexys Midnight Runners were are still the band that were closest to where I grew up. Because oh, right, okay. they, they, they were they were Wensfield, because Kevin Rudd right. was from Wensfield, arguably arguably well, arguably could argue Slade, but I think that's mainly because Noddy Elders wore Noddy Noddy Elders wore some, because um, he was from Karma slash Caldmore. But this album just makes me think of this time in my life, you know, thirteen, fourteen, fifteen, where oh, we were trying so desperately hard to be cool and. Because you're trying to be cool, you are not cool. Mm-hmm. I, I don't think I've worn a t-shirt over a long sleeve t-shirt for about twenty five years, and um, I have no intention of doing it again. Although we'll come back to that. <laughs> but yeah, so again, same. I didn't really know much about this band that that much either but um but in terms of the album itself as a whole what i found quite interesting what i found quite interesting um around this time is that with its kind of like kind of almost higher than i expected chart placements it's got a lot in tune with a, a very recent episode that at the time recording hasn't aired yet um when we discussed the band therapy with them, um, Gaz from Track One, Side One, because I know you were so because when we talked one... Trouble Gum, and you was yeah, almost Trouble Gum was one up. I would have liked to have picked. Yeah, but well, I think, but Gaz just beat you to it. <laughs> I would. I am very much looking forward to listening to your opinion of. <sighs> I think I like Trouble Gum even more than Construction for the Modern Idiot, and maybe even more than uh, The Fat of the Land. It's one of those albums that isn't absolute like top five for me when i was deciding what to pick that was one of the um i say short list it was a very fucking long list i haven't um, finished reading it it was that long <laughs> i know right and um so i did this long list of albums which did include some pop elite itself it, it, it included some very modern stuff and it included some stuff that doesn't have lyrics and so some of the stuff that has lyrics i would say again i like more than this i I like more than maybe even Fat of the Land and or Trouble Gum. But there's nothing to talk about, or there's significantly less to talk about if you pick an album that's got no lyrics. So I probably would never want to do a Dance with the Dead album, even though it would make me look cool and show that I've got modern music taste. But Construction for the Modern Idiot was not on that long list. So I agonised over this list. And then at the end, I was like, wait, you forgot Construction for the Modern Idiot. I want to do Construction for the Modern Idiot. <laughs> and yeah. I felt a bit like a modern idiot, idiot for forgetting this kind of iconic, at least to me, and certainly formative album that I've got a lot to say about. And yeah, I've made the right choice. Yeah. But I would have really liked to have done trouble gum as well yeah i think at, at yeah and at, at the moment i am kind of at the moment because of other podcasts that i'm doing i'm kind of 
doing these ahead of time. So by the time you listen, by the time you're listening, people listen to this, we're going to be in June. So that's how far ahead that we're listening to. Um, so you haven't oh. had the, so you haven't had the choice to chance to listen to the the trouble gum episode. But going back to what we said about uh, what I was talking to Gaz about about the therapy thing was that. I came in. I came to that album being quite surprised that how pop it sounded, how melodic it sounded. Mm. That it was definitely kind of almost kind of like a, a a rock, like the precursor to kind of the alternative rock that would happen in a few years' time. Um, but but without it was a whole, shadow of a doubt, it, yeah, I, I think it was incredibly influential. Yeah, and but it was very poppy, and we we kind of diverged and spoke about the Wild Hearts at times because the Wild Hearts was kind of like my kind of like com- comparative to Wild Hearts. Okay, uh, yeah, and listening to this, I'm like, I'm listening to this, and I'm kind of as I was listening to this, I'm thinking, I can see why Mark would really likes the therapy album because it's doing a lot of things in a slightly in a slightly different genre not as not as heavy mm. in terms of its rock but in terms of indie or kind of like a kind of indie kind of like almost happier kind of it indie than perhaps therapy was doing it's 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 unashamedly got pop choruses it's unashamedly yeah. pop it's it's unashamedly kind of earwormy in a very similar way that Kind of ginger wild heart always sticks a middle finger saying I don't care I I like to be pop, um, mm. yeah and I'm like I yeah I can kind of yeah I'm starting to see kind of like that kind of unashamed like pop love pop side pop side to things that people just like to embrace and I'm like I can kind of see I'm getting a, a gauge in why Mark liked like really likes therapy if based on listening to this as well and as you said you 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 think the wild hearts are great there's that kind of pop element to these I albums. Think... I think that the Troublegum album really does kind of like sit in the middle of Therapy being one of the greatest, most underrated bands of all time because the subsequent album to Troublegum, I don't love it as much, but I really want to love it more because Infernal Love was almost like a concept album and it had um, some very, very different stuff on it like diane which was all done with cellos as a background and no and it was a ballad um and it had my favorite therapy track on it stories Uh, but that album benefits even more than something like construction for the modern idiot and um troublegum from a top to bottom listen because it forms a journey where tracks like diane and stories make sense as you listen as opposed to tracks on their own, which they do stand out as amazing. But yeah, therapy, I could talk about them for days, but we're not talking about them. We're talking about the wonder yes. stuff and that, that tangented, sorry. Yeah, no, no, it's fine. But I do, but I think in terms of like understanding your kind of music taste from that era, I can kind of see, I can kind of engaging kind of like a, almost like a Facebook graph search of market in the early 90s of like the things you're kind of into in terms of like, Kind of like guitar music and stuff. But, Mark um, in the early nineties was a little bit tryhard. Yeah, <laughs> and I had McCurtain's hairdo, and um, I was the governor's son at school, and my best mate was the headmaster's son, and uh, it was all just a little bit swatty. <laughs> but um, yeah, with this, with this, like, there's. So I, 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 I don't know. I, again, I was, I was kind of expecting perhaps more kind of straight indie. Kind of like mm. this, like four boys with guitars, a drummer and stuff. But then, but then immediately there's like there's fiddles, there's kind of folk elements. Yeah. There's there's a lot and a lot of brass that suddenly kick in to which isn't it doesn't it doesn't full go into full scale. But there's a lot of kind of like uh kind of up tempo. Yeah. Like, like, brass sections with the, the saxophone, hornets, trumpets, trombones throughout. There's like a full brass, like yeah. And, and I think places. I think the Wonder stuff were really interesting because this felt this was this was their last album, or at least it was until they reformed in the mid mid noughties with um, Escape from Rubbish Island. Mm-hmm. But this was felt they they split up not long after they released Construction, and. It felt to me, at least, as heartbroken as I was, that they'd finished a journey 
musically because eight legged groove machine is exactly what you described it is very raw it is like four musicians with very kind of indie sounding from the production to the people with guitars and a drummer uh if you listen to a track like unbearable that's so incredibly raw and that was their first single and it's it's a fantastic proper indie song but you then see it progress through to um some really lovely stuff where they throw in some violins and stuff like circle like circle square on hop up to and including the really sophisticated stuff like welcome to the cheap seats on uh neville of delvis and neville of delvis featured size of a cow which was their big hit and it was kind of like a political song and it's again like you say it had lots of different instruments thrown into it opens with um some piano or whatever and it felt like this because it had the production values you're talking about it felt like they progressed album by album by album to this very kind of um produced but still brilliant album the start of on the ropes that gives you an idea of what the album was going to be like and it did feel like a slightly different sound to anything they'd ever done before and it then delivered with that when the album was released so it broke my heart that they broke up a month later but in a way it just felt like this band has made this journey and it made sense and um i had tapes of Eight Legged Groove and Hop and Never Loved Elvis. But like I say, this was actually their only album that I got on CD apart from their greatest hits. Mm. Oh, no, that's not true. I bought Escape from Rubbish Island, but I, obviously I had this conversation with the last time I was on the podcast. All my CDs were destroyed in a car crash, so I don't have any of them at all anymore. Yeah, I think I remember that conversation. I think, yeah, but um, I say, I think in, in looking to do some back, background onto this, onto this i wasn't aware that they broke well they're broken up the first time but then there are kind of articles that i read online which say that this album was very much kind of overshadowed in the end by the breakup um, mm. and i think some 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 online kind of fans have like kind of said it, it kind of got lost kind of got lost that in that john bryan on backseatmafia.com there's a intro there's a little a small like article that he'd written about this album and he goes to um he says all so he talks talking about them trying to crack the United States. Which I don't think they ever managed, did they? No, no, but like they kind of uh but I think that's I think apparently like that's when like they used to kind of, kind of tensions got strong in the band and ended up breaking up. Uh which led to which I will quote I'll quote from what John Bryan wrote on this. Um all of this has contributed to construction for the modern idiot's reputation as being the unlovable runs of the Wonder Stuff's four albums in their original run. And listening to the album now, it's a reputation it doesn't deserve. Sure Fully more, agree. Sure it has a more polished sound than its predecessors, but it retains the fine balance aggro and pop smarts that a few outside of stereo produce fine it's good for a lot. So yeah, so I, I Again, I, I, I sort of doesn't really know much about the wonder, the wonder stuff. Was that? Do, do you remember that? Do you remember much of discourse going on around that time? Or I was a bit too young. I think some of this kind of musical understanding is a bit sophisticated. I just had a group of friends who liked the same kind of music, and my favorite band released a new album, and there was a tour. So no, I don't really feel like that worked for me at all i just listened to this new album by a band i liked loved it it was amazing it was it became a favorite i think it is probably no it is my favorite wonder stuff album but that's like picking your favorite child you know so and then the breakup was devastating absolutely i'd bought this amazing album i'd been to this amazing tour and then it was all over and when you're 14 or 15, that's that's the end of your fucking world, isn't it? But with hindsight, it even like a few years later when I was a teenager and I was starting to um, develop a, a more heavier rock kind of a taste, again, towards stuff like Trouble Gun, actually, um, I kind of retrospectively was like, it was probably the right decision for them because because of this 
four album run that was fantastic yeah and so this was 93 in a couple of years in a couple of years time rock changed again again very sim- very similar to what I was talking to Gaz about on the therapy episode when between Trouble Gum and the next time the therapy came out, I think it was about four years later, rock completely had changed. The, the landscape had changed. Like, um, yeah. Yeah. For, I mean, the, 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 the thing that blows my mind, the thing that blew my mind on that episode was like, you know, say you take Hybrid Theory by Linkin Park. Fantastic yeah. album. Fantastic album. Yeah. We did an episode, we already done an episode on that, but then I know. there's six years in between that and Trouble Gum. Seven years between that right. album and this one, right? Yeah, and that like, makes a lot of sense. Yeah, yeah, but like they they feel kind of almost like, and that's kind of like the cooler side of new metal, new metal, which I think kind of changed the landscape by the time. So if there were, so if the Wonder Stuff had probably kept stuck around, they probably would they probably would have suddenly found themselves in the midst of, particularly I think what the the uh, it would be a bit pop, wouldn't it, in the mid nineties that probably would have. Yeah, 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 exactly. Been, that would have been against what they were trying to do and stuff. And have you done Collision Course on Pick a Disc? By who? Jay Z and Linkin Park. No. Have you heard of Collision Course? Yes. It's fucking brilliant. Like ridiculously great. good, ridiculously good album. It's only six tracks though, so maybe do it as like a uh, special episode <laughs> yeah, special. or something. Suggesting specials. Well, I mean, <laughs> who'd have thought? It? Yeah, <laughs> sorry, <laughs> very, very, very niche in joke. Um, so, well, I don't know. A lot of people. I would, I would say that there's quite a lot of people that would listen to both Shipwrecked and Comatose and pick a disc. Mm. And if you don't, if you don't, you'll have to listen to Shipwrecked and Comatose to understand that joke. <laughs> you should. It's very good. Um, yeah. So, but yeah. So I think for like for the time that is for this album in like the kind of time that it was in around the 90s um quite a lot of, from what quite a lot of it kind of i can kind of hear things that are happening now um again i don't again i can like particularly romance is boring from lots of um like when suddenly brass appears um it's like it's like oh god there's brass instruments in a lost mm. song and stuff um and which doesn't delve which doesn't delve too much into scar punk thank, <laughs> thankfully mm. even though i'm not even though i don't have an issue with it yeah, I just, I, I just, I, I was just like, oh, I can't, yeah, this is kind of like nice, to, kind of nice to listen to. I was quite enjoying listening to it. So, uh, don't know, you was quite, you, you said you was kind of like slash petrified and curious to see my opinion on the actual album itself. Yeah, I, I don't think I'd have coped well if you hated it. Yeah, I, I really liked it. I think it, so, and I'm not just saying that either. <laughs> Honest. Um, Do you but, think uh, you'll listen to more Wonder stuff? Do you think you'll go back and maybe see the journey I? described to you because i think particularly the the contrast between eight-legged groove and construction there is a you and you can definitely see a progression between the four albums but eight-legged groove it's do you remember the first silver chair album how incredibly raw that sounded and how you could tell that it was from the lyrics to the the heaviness of the guitar you could tell it was done by teenagers but it was remarkably good regardless no that's <laughs> god damn it. you've not listened to frog stomp no the un- my, my, the un- maybe that's my next pick frog the only, stomp by silver chair the only thing i know from silver chair is what someone from that band worked with someone else from another band to create an album called the dissociatives i've not heard of that uh let me do a fact check that because I'm pretty sure it is. I'm pretty sure it's someone from Silver Chair. Was it Andy Johns? Daniel Johns. Daniel Johns, sorry. D- uh, Daniel Johns of Silver Chair and dance producer Paul Mack of Itchy and Scratchy, which formed in 2003. Yeah, they had uh, an album, a self titled album called The Dissociatives. Um, so, yeah, that's the only kind of. That's you know, my only kind of. Silver, Silver Chair. Chair. Even more extreme than the progression from Eight Legged Groove through Hup and um, Neville of Delvis to Construction. I feel like Silver Chair, their progression from Frog Stomp to Freak Show, then uh, Neon Ballroom is even more kind of noticeably 
you can see the progression between the albums. And oh, fucking Frog Stomp's brilliant. Freak Show is good. And Neon Ballroom is so good. I just love music, Matt. And I forget <laughs> sometimes. And coming on podcasts like this kind of really reminds me how much music matters to me and how much I actually do get passionate and understand music perhaps a little more than I give myself credit for. Yeah, because I mean, I mean, like, I think on whenever it's popped up, particularly with, particularly when on other podcasts we've done with our mutual friend Colin, who's been on here far too many times, and, <laughs> 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 um, and like you're always going, oh, you're always saying like, oh, I don't know if I can speak much about music, but I'll have a go, and then like, yeah, I think you kind of surprise yourself at how much you probably know and how much kind of musical experience you've got. It's a bit like everything in my life. Yeah. I kind of have these tiny little niches that you pick out of midair fucking randomly. And I'll have like insanely kind of intense and concentrated knowledge of this specific little niche of a specific little thing. But the kind of surrounding information isn't for Mark. So, um, it, it, so yeah, I think if you ask me about another band that isn't therapy, Silver Chair or The Wonder Stuff that I've only kind of gently listened to. I wouldn't be able to talk like this. Obviously, I wouldn't be able to talk like this. But fucking hell, I want to do Frog Stomp with you now. <laughs> yeah, I think we, we all can't be Colin. <laughs> <He's>, <laughs> who I, our friend Colin, who, I, who I'm, I'm convinced is the walking Wikipedia of music. I, I don't know how he does it. I don't, I don't have <laughs> enough space in my brain for my overall knowledge of everything <laughs> compared to his knowledge of music. Yeah. But um, yeah, so if we move on to talking a few about some of these songs. Um, Can we talk about the front cover? Yes, because I always forget to talk about the art. I know, you do. It even says on your notes. <laughs> yeah, the front cover. It's, um, apparently it's from the 1960s. A photograph of a space observation project of a Kettering Grammar School in Northampton, Northamptonshire. Which fascinates me because I always assumed until doing some research for this uh, episode of Bigger Disc, I just assumed it had been a mock-up that they'd just done and had a photography session with, you know, just a few kids and a and a and a, per and a man, and they pretended they'd set it up as a photo as a photograph for the front cover, and the fact that it's real people, and so there's there's the there's a kid on the, the kind of prominent in the front, and I'm guessing if it was the sixties. So he would have been about 40, maybe, by the by the time the album was released. I'd love to know what his opinion was of being on the front cover of Construction of the Modern Idiot. By, construction for the Modern... <laughs> fuck's sake. I'd love to know what his opinion of being on the front cover of Construction for the Modern Idiot by The Wonder Stuff, what, what his opinion of that was, and whether or not he even fucking knew. Yeah, I think... But, yeah, I think it's interesting about why, yeah, again, why they picked it, but... Um, interesting thing as well, saying that it's observation project at Kettering Grammar School. Uh, the person featured on the album cover is Peter Johnson, head of geography at Oak Mid School for Boys, Duck Lane, Bournemouth, later become its deputy head. And this invention won for Peter Johnson an FRGS, which is a fellow of the Royal Geographical Society. So I think it's the kind of globe thingy yeah. that's on there and stuff. But um, yeah, as just randomly, I was going to, I just clicked the Kettering Grammar School in that section on the on the album's Wikipedia page goes yeah. to a Wikipedia page dedicated to the school. And I mean, it closed in 1976 and then completely closed in 93, which I'm assuming meant demolished. Um, right. Demolished stuff. But there's a huge, huge chunk dedicated to space research. Wow. <laughs> on this school. Yeah. So apparently the head of the school department, physics department experimented with using satellite signals and the Doppler effect as an aid to teaching and the activity soon grew into regular monitoring of Soviet launch satellites and expanded into the, an international collaboration that became known as the Kettering Group and this group was headed by Perry who then had become the head of science teaching. On the technical front Perry was partnered by the head of chemistry department Derek Slater a, rad, an, a radio amateur. Um, I'd, I'd love to know why this was picked for the front cover. And I wonder if it's because of this incredible story about this school. I, 
But so this this bloke on the front cover, the, the, like I said, there's the there's the boy prominent, very central in the in the picture. He will probably be about seventy seventy five now, so he's the same age as my dad. And I just wonder if he ever knew he was on the front cover of this album. <laughs> sorry, I'm sorry. I'm sorry, I was just talking. I just carried on reading the. Uh, I I I love this paragraph, and I never thought I'd ever have an actual tangent which is related to an album but basically do it okay the activities of perry and his team created considerable interest an article which had been published in aviation week magazine in 1957 had revealed that the u.s had been tracking russian missile launches from an advanced long-range radar units in turkey the article caused a fury with president dwight eisenhower special assistant of national security affairs robert cutler referring to the article as treasonable it was claimed that the story started out with perry and his students and that perry had advised the writer of the magazine that a radar in Turkey was doing important space intel tracking so the writer dug into the story Fucking so basically hell. so basically this school this school that was based on this photo that on, on this um, artwork led like ended up having the uh, uh, an actual official statement from the White House saying that an article written about this school was was, was a tantamount to treason they, they caused an international incident, <laughs> incident. brilliant so yeah, I'm wondering. Yeah, I wonder. Yeah, I think, and apparently, this that photo was actually published in the Times. Um, so the one photo. So I, I wonder how much of that was related to, or, or whether it was just coincidental. I'm not sure, but that's fascinating. Uh, it, I think it could be one of two things. One of the band, band members found about that, found out about this story, and was like, "What an incredible thing! Let's put it on the front cover of the album." Or that's a fun picture. It could, you know, I mean, yeah. it could be literally either of those things, and I'd love to know. And um, I don't know Miles Hunt or any of the uh, other band members, unfortunately, so I can't ask them. <laughs> yeah, def- definitely, but uh, that find that quite interesting. So, um, so about the, some of the songs themselves. Uh, how long have we got there? Okay, so some of the songs themselves. I would want to. If there's any songs that jump out, which songs jump out to you from this? So, Beyond On The Ropes, which is a 100% 10 out of 10 banger, a perfect song. I would describe this album as an album of 7 out of 10s. Mm. And that is very, very good because no album is that. Or very rarely do you have a consistently very good album. It doesn't feel like there's any tracks on this album that they... They just stuck on to make it up to 12, you know? And did you listen to the original or did you listen to the one with the four extra tracks? Because those four extra tracks I would probably say are the weakest. Uh, the one that I listened on Spotify was one with 13 songs. The right, bonus so track listen. version. So Hank and John, Closer to Fine, I think it must have had something really useful to say in Room 512. They weren't on the disc that i was talking about and there's really only i think i must have had something really useful to say that is worth much in my opinion <laughs> yeah no the only one the one i'm listening to was on spotify so yeah which so it was the 12 tracks but spotify will sometimes if there's a bonus track split that into a separate track so the one yes, i've listened to the... was 13 so something for sammy closes the album that it's was like a, the original a hidden track. You had to listen for about, I think it was about 10 or 15 minutes at the end, and it just played after that. Uh, it wasn't one of the ones you had to rewind backwards for. It was one of the ones you just had to wait for at the end of the disc, something for Sammy. Okay. But yeah, the, the bonus tracks, I do like, I think I must have had something really useful to say. And I think it's 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 a 7 or an 8 out of 10 But the other three... They don't add to this album. In fact, I would say they take away from it. And they just don't resonate with me because they weren't the stuff that I was listening to because they were added in, I think it was a re-release, maybe the year 2000. I didn't have that version. I didn't want that version. And that version is the one that I was listening to on Spotify. And I'm like, no, you should have just left it. Should have just left it. Hmm. So maybe they're the weaker ones. They're the ones I would skip. 
apart from I think I must have had something really useful to say. If we go back to the ones that are on the arm and stuff, so what is it about on the ropes that that makes you think it's 10 out of 10? I just, I think from the very first kind of base slide, it's just so bold and so kind of wonder stuff at their best. And the vocals, it's just, yeah. I listened to this song so much that I could sing the lyrics from start to finish. And so could my mum. <laughs> <laughs> Not by choice. <laughs> Not by choice, no. <laughs> um, and I think what makes me quite sad is that I've never seen this song on karaoke because I'd fucking smash it. <laughs> and um, it, it, it just, it's anthemic, it's iconic, it's classic wonder stuff, but with some fun stuff like the, the, the bass slide I was talking about and the... For me, I know you've been talking a lot about the brass, but the violin is a very, very, very important part of the Wonder Stuff sound because that very much started from Hup onwards. And it just... And I, I was a string player at school. I was a cellist at school. So I think just everything about a song that builds, 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 banging chorus with violins and with innovative shit and Miles hunt on vocals it just, it, it's just it's just fantastic it's a fantastic mm. song oh yeah you're not gonna you're not gonna get any argument with me violin. i love violins on a tra- mm. track again uh, like early los camasinos violins <laughs> there we go yeah violins and stuff but um yeah but but there's a very kind of like almost kind of like late 80s american rock intro to on the ropes where like you see, you can probably see me, like you're suddenly expecting Steve Perry from Journey to start singing, mm. <laughs> singing over it, or like, yeah. or almost like hair metal, like hair metal yeah. stars. Which, but, but, then, but then kind of, but then, but then like you got Miles Hunt's kind of vocals, and then that then that bass gets that bass is almost unrock like. Throughout it, so he kind of starts adding its own kind of unique spin. So it's, it's, you begin to think if it's going to go one direction and it doesn't afterwards. Yeah, I, but I think part of part of the song's charm is the kind of everybody join in. It's happened to me. Part of the chorus that it, I think it's such a strong chorus, such a strong everybody's mm-hmm. anticipating. Everybody jumps in to sing along to that. I think it's it's just a perfect rock song. <laughs> yeah, yeah. <clears throat> I say I think as as I'm kind of got it really really quietly on Spotify in my headphones at the moment. Um, that chorus, yeah. I've just noticed this is the one where the modern idiot is here, which is where which comes back to the yeah. I was saying so you can't. So this could theoretically be the kind of center piece of the album that it's building to, like the, the United themes this album stuff. Um. The one, the one that I kind of, the one song that I want to point out, that I think kind of said to me is that um, the type, the title kind of jumped out to me when I started listening to the lyrics. I was like, "Ooh, okay, this is." I know this, what you're gonna say. Yeah, I was like, "This, this is a, this is be an interesting song for 2023, not just 1993." Do you know which one I'm on about? I think you you want to talk about "I Wish Them All Dead." Yes. <laughs> Yep, that is legitimately about the MBLA or how they're better known since South Park, um, Mambla. Yeah. And um, there was an episode of South Park in like 97, 98, where the the boys joined Mambla, which is the Man and Boy Love Association. Mm. And this song was a vitriol-filled, hate the paedophiles, kill them all song by the Wonder Stuff. And um, it's not subtle, is it? No, it, uh, just a tad. Um, but yeah, but uh, yeah. So it's like um, I wish them cancerous decay that puts an end to their days, which is uh It's not subtle, no. Yeah, I, you know these fucks have the balls to use municipal halls. It's it's yeah. It's kind of like yeah. You can kind of you can kind of see what Mars Hunt's opinion of uh, 
It sounds like he found out about something that shocked him yeah. and he immediately put pen to paper, doesn't it? And it is pure hate. Mm. And do you know what? All right, you can do that. Yeah. And um, that, that that is a highlight of the album. I think they were right to put it on second rather than first. And I feel like Change Every Light Bulb kind of, brings you in and it had a really strong wonder stuff sound and then let's talk about men who fuck boys <laughs> yeah i was like i was i was i was quite surprised i was listening to that i was like and then well so i i, 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 I wasn't sure what the mbla was at first was yeah at first and then like and then when i googled it, it was like why do why are they attacking a like a, a physics department, a college in America or something like that. Yeah. And then, but then it, t- it takes, a, t- t- I think he's, he's scrolling down and suddenly like there was, a, there's like a, the fourth or fifth result is like a, something that mentions it, referencing to Nambler, Nambler from the South Park episode. And I'm like, yeah, that makes a lot more sense now. But uh, yeah. So um, any other songs that you want to highlight? I think Hot Love Now was the correct single choice post the release of the album it's super super catchy and um it feels like again i I think i said this and got proved horribly wrong the last time i was on the podcast but it feels like um the no i've lost what i was going to say bollocks what was i going to say and then straight after hot love now you've got full of life with the clap 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 iconic and um Another correct choice for a single release. And then I think Storm Drain suffers because it's between two singles and the best song, in my opinion, that the Wonder Stuff ever did. It's a perfectly good six and a half, seven out of ten album track. But with, and, and the harmonica is great. Fantastic. Like, like you were saying, they bring in brass, they bring in violins, they bring in a harmonica. I think it was Miles Hunt on the harmonica, if I remember rightly. I think it's crazy and, for that, yeah. And it's really, really a, a grossly underrated song because of where it is on the album. And I think that's a shame. What do, Did you like Storm Drain or did you, because obviously you didn't have the kind of knowledge of these are the three singles. And would you have skipped Storm Drain, do you think? I think it's. I think it's probably. Cause I listened to the album about three or four times in the lead up to this. So, mm. and but it's pretty much all the way through, and I don't really like skipping. So, I'm skipping tracks isn't really a thing until like if I'm if it's in like proper rotation. But right. So I'm just, I say I've got it quietly in the background again now, listening to it, and I think it's one of these kind of kind of songs songs that you kind of need in albums that kind of help take the peaks and the highs so if you're not going to have an album of full-on banger 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 you're going you're going to need to have like the quote-unquote slow song mm. or the or the song that i mean or the song that when played live means the band can stop jumping around and the crowd can just like <laughs> tip back and stuff and um which so, and uh as we're about to go head on to the live section bit so i'm pretty sure that few I'm pretty sure that this song might be useful for a bunch of older Wonder, Wonder Stuff fans when it comes on playing live. Um, mm. Um, mm. But yeah, I think I think particularly around that peak, it's it's around it's the right place for this kind of kind of peaking kind of or the the valley even to kind of like relax for a bit to kind of gather thoughts and wrap up stuff. I don't know is I don't know whether this would be would have been the the point where you the last song of Side A, because it has that energy to it. Yeah, yeah, that's probably true. Mm. And I, I guess on tape it's more difficult to skip. But Yeah. And um, I think if we go, if we kind of jump ahead to um, look at like A Great Drinker and Hush, again, the notes I've made, it's about how varied the album was with like harmonica, violin, trumpet, whistling and the sitar. It's just, they would, you would never have imagined that the band that released Eight Legged Groove Machine would have this level of diversity on an mm. album. They, you know, they just progressed so much. And 
this album is you could argue is overproduced compared to what their sound used to be but i, I think evolution wise i think it's fantastic and um something like your big ass mother like you were talking about peaks and troughs that track has peaks and troughs in the track it's got a really slow build and then an absolute smash of a chorus and and, and i'm a sucker for a violin so that's a favorite of mine that track your mm. big ass mother and I, ne- I also wonder why they never released swell as a fourth single because that's that screams single to me yeah i'm not sure i don't know would you I, agree I, I, with that, or would you say that there's another song that you thought could have been the fourth single release? I don't know. I think at the time, I think at the time to clear the band were kind of heading for a breakup at that point. Mm. Um, break up at that point, anyway. I think they probably probably wouldn't have got, probably just didn't have time to do a fourth release, and the mm. album would have been out by then. So, considering I think in relation to the singles that were released and how how and the kind of less well performed they did in the in the charts. I don't think a fourth single probably would have helped. No, that's probably but, true. Um, but um, but yeah. So uh, I think the right. the one last thing I want to say is I want to quote um one of the lines from "Sing the Absurd." Yeah. I've always been really, really cautious around drugs. I never really did anything. Um, the strongest I ever did was a few funny fags at Glastonbury in 1997. And um, part of that is because I know myself and I am I have quite an addictive personality. I got a tattoo and now I'm covered. I buy one, um, I don't know, one collectible and then I've got them all. And you I start think... one podcast. And then you've got a hundred. You're absolutely <laughs> right. I, yeah. I'm, I'm, I have quite an addictive personality. I find something I like and I go f- fucking horns in straight, you know, like a bull in a china shop. And I've always been very, very scared of drugs for that reason, because I know who I am and I know what I'm like. But there's a line in Sing the Absurd that really speaks to me. If there was a drug that would do me no harm, I'd get a needle and I'd stick it in my arm. Yep, I'd definitely do that. I know I would <laughs> definitely do that. It's because I was educated relatively well from quite a young age about the harm that drugs can do. And knowing who I am, I was so petrified of them that I was like, you, I, I've never, never taken ecstasy. I've never s- snorted cocaine or anything. And I have a lot of friends who do. And I have through my entire life. None of them are dickheads who like peer pressure me or judge me because I don't, which is nice. But a lot of my friends take recreational drugs. And I've always, always said no because I'm petrified of what it all, what could potentially happen. Whereas if you could give me something that makes me get this high that I see my other people, my make that allows me to reach this high that I've seen other people get. But there's no risk. Fuck yeah, I do it every single fucking day. But yeah, I think it's a really cynical line. But for some reason, it really spoke to me. Hmm. Yeah, yeah, that makes that makes sense. I think uh, very kind of clever way of just saying like recognizing kind of the addictiveness of something, but then like almost mm. like a placebo, like like looking for a placebo to satiate a kind of addictive nature in people i think yeah. it's a peculiar twist on drugs are bad okay isn't it mm, yeah <laughs> if we're yeah. going to reference south park, park twice again. yeah <laughs> south park's been referenced quite a few times in episodes post that post that south park movie episode i think but um reception of the, i couldn't find much on the reception of the album if i'm completely honest the only thing i found was a, a quite negative all music review go on um which was only like a paragraph, which uh, largely dropping the playful folk rock feel of 1991's excellent Neville of Elvis uh, in favour of a lacklustre return to the kind of speedy guitar pop that introduced the group in 1988 to the eight-legged groove machine without that album's youthful energy. Construction for the modern idiot feels like the group is treading over already played ground. 
fully um, 100% disagree with everything other than the fact that they say that Never Loved Elvis is a great album. <laughs> Real change is singer-songwriter Miles Hunt's lyrics, which have gone from clever and sassy to painfully obvious. Oh, fuck off. Uh, and it's... All lyrics are obvious. <laughs> fuck off. Yeah. But no, I think it was generally not received well. Mm. And I know it's not a favourite. It's it's my favourite Wonder Stuff album, but I know most Wonder Stuff fans wouldn't pick this. They'd probably pick Never Loved Elvis, I think, as their favourite Wonder Stuff album. But Was I it... think more people would pick this than um, Escape from Rubbish Island, which is another Wonder Stuff album I think is underrated. I, I, I... Question that I've probably forgotten to ask, and it's the first <laughs> time I've, I think it's the first time I've forgotten to ask it in, in the correct place. Was this the first album of theirs you listened to? Of theirs that I listened to, no. Yeah. Um, yeah. The first album of theirs that I listened to was Never Loved Elvis, and then I bought retroactively bought Hop and Eight Legged Groove Machine backwards, which is something I actually did a lot with music. Similar to, in fact, I did it with The Prodigy. The first album I listened to was. Jilted Generation, then I went back to listen to um, Experience before I then moved forward again when they released Fat of the Land. Ah, uh, okay. Okay, so uh, so it's not even the, the case that you, because it was, so it's not even the case that it was the first one of theirs you listened to, so you've got that emotional attachment to it. No. Which, which no. is, which, uh, the, for example, like the only, the only kind of analogy that I can give is the fact that I'll still class Star Trek Voyager is my favourite Star Trek show because it was the first one that I saw. <laughs> hmm. Never thought about that. I think I'd watched a bit of Star Trek, but the first one I watched properly was Next Gen, and that's still my favourite. So maybe there's something to that. But I think it's a similar thing like I was talking at the start of the episode about how, because it was my first ever CD, maybe mm. that's part of where my attachment comes for the album. Maybe. Yeah. Yeah, I think so. You got that kind of emotional kind of like, milestone attached to it mm, so mm. and again that probably explains why i'll always have a soft spot mr blobby but, um, <laughs> i haven't got a soft spot for donald where's your trousers it's fucking terrible <laughs> i can never remember the artist's name as well it's just some scottish bloke you know what donald where's your trousers it's trousers t-r-o-o-s-e-r-s if you're gonna google it Andy Stewart. Andy Stewart. There you go. I'd I'd have never got that. Fucking Donald, where's your trousers? Genuinely, one of my biggest humiliations in my entire life. <laughs> have you ever seen the Wonder Stuff live? Yes, once in 1993 for the construction for the Modern Idiot tour <laughs> at the Wolverhampton Civic Hall, which I'm sure you're not surprised by. <laughs> Not at all. I'm assuming that um, that was probably a, that was probably the hometown show, so it was probably busy yeah. and energetic, and it was massive. So the Civic Hall, Wolverhampton, was a shit hole even when I was a kid. It's worse now. But <laughs> the one thing Wolverhampton had for young people was genuinely one of the best gig ven- venues in the entire UK, and it's. It was for years and years and years. And have they even fucking reopened it yet, the, the Civic? I don't know. I think, I don't know. I it's think been I closed been... for four years? I think I've only been to one gig there. It's a great venue, though, isn't it? Yeah. I th- yeah, I think, yeah, I'm pretty sure I've only been to one gig. Didn't you say you went to Blast Off, though? I went to Blast Off, but yeah, mm. went to Blast Off a few times, but I've not been, but in terms of an actual gig, I've only been to, I think, one at. The Civic. I've been, I've been to Slide Rooms a few times. Um, slide Rooms is not as good. Yeah. And for, oh, for people that aren't from Wolverhampton, Blast Off is a indie club night at um, the Wolverhampton Civic Hall. Yeah, which which was like great. I still have me- that was. I still have memories of the first time I I rec- rem- the first time I kind of remember listening to the Wombats um, mm. properly. I think it was when they played Techno Fan, and I and I discovered Shazam had live lyrics. And Amazing. basically, it was me and a few friends trying. Like sh- I shazammed it, and we were singing along to this song we'd never heard before called "Techno Techno Fan Boy <laughs> Wombats." <laughs> singing along, uh, right? Not, <laughs> not I didn't know it did that. That's pretty cool. Yeah, I think. Um, I think it was it, the graphics have changed for it now. It was like, but it had like kind of like word art coming on in animated. Huh. Too. Yeah, rather than just like the line by line stuff. But um, 
But the the Civic Hall is genuinely one of the the best gig venues in the UK, in my opinion. And um, I remember this is a massive tangent. Don't care. I remember when I got to perform there as a professional wrestling ring announcer. That's one of my jobs. I remember it was a huge, huge deal. Um, Wolverhampton Civic Hall and um, Manchester Ritz, venues where I've seen in Wolverhampton, for example, the Wonder Stuff, the Levelers, um, and countless of my heroes in my youth. And then the Ritz where I'd seen Terrorvision and Alice Cooper and other stuff. To actually get to be on stage in those places, it's it's not... I'm not a musician like Colin or other people that might talk about that. I'm a, I'm, a, I'm a ring announcer for wrestling. But to actually, you know, use these changing rooms that I've had fucking Alice Cooper or Miles Hunt in, you know, and just see how shit they are backstage. It's, um, <laughs> it's, it's genuinely something that I really, really value. And I'm very, very fortunate to have been able to perform at the Civic, you know. Talking about the Civic, have you ever been to the De Montford Hall in Leicester? No, I haven't. Imagine the Civic, but the Civic having a budget to keep it, to actually make it look nice and keep it. (laughs) (laughs) Wow, the savagery. (laughs) I think at least until it became particularly dilapidated, I think that was part of the Civic's charm, actually, Mm. was that it had this great space, this fantastic stage, and it was a little bit ramshack a little mm. bit rough around the edges you might see a bucket with a drip <laughs> at, the, at the civic and i think that was part of its charm and, and i know my um i don't know if it was the wonder stuff but i know my brother met his wife in their teenage years they're still together and they've provided me with two very beautiful uh nibblings i lo- i don't know whether i like that term nieces and nephews um but yeah, they they met at the Civic and they had their first snog at the Civic and mm. they've been together thirty years. It's it's, some, it's it's such an important venue to me in so many ways, and they really should open it. And when they do, I even if I could see them in Manchester or Liverpool, I think I'd like to go and see a gig at uh, the Civic Hall. Just one, just because. I hadn't been for years and then they closed it. And you know when, like, you you don't know you're going to miss it until it's gone? That kind of vibe. Mm. It it was like a fucking gut punch when they closed the Civic. Because, again, of associating the time of my life that I've been talking about this whole episode, I associate those happy memories with that. And I did used to go to, like, the Dorchester reunions at the Civic, the Dorchester being a nightclub mm-hmm. I went to in my late teens. and once in a blue moon i would go back to the civic and it was always how i remember like i said a little bit ramshackle a little bit rough around the edges but a fucking great venue and yeah i don't like i said i don't even know when they're going to reopen it because it's been closed for forever but they need to because it's iconic Mm. and are you planning on seeing the wonder stuff again well here's the thing Construction for the Modern Idiot was released in 1993. And the Wonder Stuff, days after I finally decided this is what I wanted to talk to you with, talk to, days after I decided that this is the album I wanted to talk to you about, put up an image on their Facebook page, ID30T, in the same font as they'd used for Construction for the Modern Idiot. And I hadn't even clocked how old this album was because it's been a part of my life consistently since it was released. This album is 30 years old. And what they're doing is they're doing the same tour again as the one that I saw them at the, the Wolverhampton Civic Hall. <laughs> and I was both delighted and fucking mortified how old I am. (laughs) Um, And so I immediately pounced on the tickets when they were released. And they're kind of splitting the tour. Mm -hmm. They're doing um, four or five dates. Then they're having a few months off. And then they're doing it again later in the year. Um, So I've bought tickets for Liverpool 
and um, I'm going with my brother who, uh, you know, he went to see the Wonder Stuff with me 30 years ago and we both have very fond memories of the, the gig and um, we're going to go to that. And depending on how much I love it, I may get tickets for Manchester as well. And I'm also going to, after this conversation, I'm going to look and see if they're going to play the Civic as well. Because if they're going to play the Civic, you fucking stop me. You fucking stop me. I'm going to go and see them at the Civic. I think they're playing Birmingham. Nah, it's not the same. Playing Birmingham. It's not the same. It needs to be the venue. Oh, so we've got, so I've just gone on to the Wonder Stuff page. So they've got mm. Miles Hunt solo at the Midlands Art Centre. In no, the Mac. it's not what I want. No, it's not what I want. Um, blah, blah, blah. But yeah, 24th of July. Will this have aired by then? Yes. All right. So very soon after this airs, I'll be going to see the Wonder Stuff 30 years on from the first time I saw them. No, they're playing, ugh, playing the Academy. Yeah, the, that's not what we want. Birmingham. But I mean, the original tour, I'll never forget this. And it blows my mind. I, You know, I've been to see Metallica. I've been to see Tool. I've been to see Black Sabbath. I've been to see Linkin Park. I've been to see incredible proper metal bands. Very, very kind of... I've, I've been to see another one. No, just got that. And... I'll never forget this. And maybe in my head it's because I was young and maybe I'm misremembering. But the most savage mosh I've ever been at was that this tour at Wolverhampton Civic Hall. Everyone fell over. Everyone was stomping on each other. I remember this bloke was protecting his girlfriend and he got his hand in my solar plexus, preventing me from being pushed onto her from behind. There was a huge crowd behind me. And I remember thinking I was going to fucking die because you can't put your palm into someone's solar plexus without taking all of the breath from their body. I'm not angry with this guy because, you know, his girlfriend was going to fucking die if I fell on her. But I remember it scaring the shit out of me. And it might be why I'm not particularly into moshes anymore, if I'm being brutally honest with you. But it was um, it was genuinely the most brutal mosh I've ever been in. And um, another one that was quite brutal was uh, Queens of the Stone Age when I went to see them. Foo Fighters, same drummer. <laughs> and um, yeah, but this one, vividly, I remember the mosh being incredibly scary, incredibly scary. And still, I had the best time. And one of my biggest regrets of the entire, of, of and one of my biggest regrets is that I didn't buy a tour t-shirt and they were fucking iconic. They had in big kind of like, it looks like the typewriter font that they use on the front cover of the album. It just has idiot across the front. And then on the back, just a little wolf, just a little wonder stuff logo. And they were fucking iconic. And so many people bought them and they looked so cool. And I still see people wearing them to this day. <laughs> They're incredible. And again, you know, I don't go to a gig these days without buying a tour T-shirt. And that that's something I've started doing post-COVID, is going to more gigs and making sure I get a T-shirt. Because it's cool. And you stop me from getting a reprinted idiot T-shirt. It's probably going to have the 30 on it, I would guess. But am I going to get one of those? I might even get two. <laughs> um. Well, I, 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 my, I hope that you fulfil that life dream of getting. It is. It was <laughs> honestly yeah. though. Those t-shirts were so cool, and I just didn't have the money because I was fourteen and I was just didn't have any money. And I loved those t-shirts, and it felt like every time I saw someone wearing it, I was being taunted. <laughs> so I'm going to write that wrong. Um, before we move on, I just thought I had had a quick Google, and the halls Wolverhampton are reopening in June this year. Oh, yeah, but the ones that aren't playing halls. there. No, fuck that. It's the Civic Hall. There's but no re way. Rebranded the halls, but uh... no one is ever going to call it the halls. Fuck off. 
And then when you fucked off, fuck off a bit more. But uh, so, yeah, so basically I'm just looking at the June opening program of shows they've got. So they've got Penn and Teller, Leftfield, The Twang, James Bay, The Vamps, uh, The Shires, McFly, James, Susie, Sparks, Sugar Babes. Sparks, you say? Yeah. No, Sugar Babes point. are playing. Fuck the Sugar Babes. Sparks might be worth going yeah. to see. And Penn no. and Teller as well, to be honest with you. Two Door Cinema Club. Oh, I've oh, heard they're Ingy. good. I only know I only know their first album, which I really liked, which is a. Uh, this other one goes. Yeah, it's Tori. Yeah, uh, what you want. Yeah, yeah. yeah. That, that, that that album's really good, Tori's history. But um, so we pre- so we briefly just so we just briefly touched upon other albums. If people listen to this album for the first time and want to venture elsewhere in the Wonderstuff discography, where do you recommend they go next? I recommend you do it the opposite way to how I did it. Um, I started with Never Loved Elvis and moved backwards through Hop to Eight Legged Groove. What I would suggest you do is you listen to them in order because of the progression that I talked of before. You see this very raw band in... You see this very raw band in Eight Legged Groove. You then see this band discovering itself in (coughs) Hop. You see them at the kind of almost like what most people consider the height of their power and their their most famous in Never Loved Elvis. And then you see them at their maturest in Construction for the Modern Idiot. And then you see them cashing in, but it's still kind of good with um, Escape from Rubbish Island. So I would actually say, because I enjoy the journey personally, that you should listen to them in that order. Okay. Okay, so basically chronologically. chronologically. Yes, so, indeed. Yeah. So um, then we're at the very, very most important question of the episode, which is the song for the Spotify Hall of Fame playlist. Now, anyone who's not listened to this before, what this is, I'm going to ask Mark to pick one song from this album to be more slides forever on the Spotify Hall of Fame playlist. I can't veto it. What Mark says goes. So, Mark, which song are you going to pick? I might guess what it might. I think I can guess already. But what song are you going to pick to put on this playlist? So before this conversation, it was a 100% lock-in. However, how much do I want to wind up, Matt? (laughs) uh, I'm not going to do it, but because you were clearly kind of like blown away by I Wish Them All Dead and what it was about and how fucking blatant and just (laughs) mad it actually is to have that as a song subject i did momentarily consider putting that in but i'm not gonna although that is a favorite of mine on the album um it's i'm gonna be billy basic and i don't care i'm gonna pick the greatest song in my opinion that the wonder stuff ever did please put on the ropes on your list okay so on the ropes is the latest is the latest song to join the spotify hall of fame playlist um, what was put on from um, Trouble Gum? Nowhere. It's a very good choice. It's a very good choice. That wouldn't have been what I put on. But I wouldn't have put on Screamager either. Mm. But yeah, so that so that follows... Uh, actually, I'm not going to do that because there might be one before this one that I've been booked yet. So that's the latest track to be added onto the playlist following all the other ones. That have come before it. Um, this episode is episode one hundred and which um, I'm keeping that in. <laughs> wow, <laughs> I'm keeping that. Um, which is about when were you on last on? You were last on. I think it was around number sixty, if I remember. <laughs> no. Go on. <laughs> you weren't. You were, the last time you were on were was episode thirty four. Good grief! I thought it was much more recent than that. Um, the reco- the the air the episode air date was twenty eighth of April twenty twenty. Good grief! We recorded the recording of the episode was the nineteenth of March. Pandemic times, wasn't it? Yeah. So that was just before because I remember the next one I recorded was the Strokes episode, which was on the first of April, and I remember that I'm pretty sure that was the first time that the, the COVID was brought up on the podcast. Didn't you have um? Didn't you have an Idlewild episode around the same time? Idlewild was the one directly after the Prodigy. Mm. 
yeah, that was with um, Annie Music. Um, but yeah, so it's yeah, so it's been practically over three years. Good grief! I genuinely thought it was more recent than that. Bring me on again because I've enjoyed it, and I'll pick something maybe vaguely modern rather than ninety shit. No, I won't. I'll pick ninety shit. <laughs> vaguely modern. <laughs> well, yeah, but um, yeah, Mark, you're always welcome. Always welcome back. If people want to find you and your podcasts, where can they find you? So if you're looking for me personally, you can find me at Mark Adams HC on Twitter and Instagram. I'm a bit better at Twitter, even though it's well dodgy these days. So and, by gonna... the t- and by the time this possibly could air, Twitter might, <laughs> we might don't. all be on Mastodon. <laughs> we might don't. all be on Mastodon. I don't like change. I don't yeah. like new things, but Elon Musk is a cunt. And um, you can also find me, if you're enjoying me on the podcasty type sitch, you can find me on two podcasts at the moment. There are lots that I've done in the past, but the ones I'm currently on are Shipwrecked and Comatose, alongside a certain Mr. Latham, Mm -hmm. which is about Red Dwarf. And we're making our way through all the episodes of Red Dwarf, plus many, 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 many tangents. Uh, (laughs) Yeah, I mean, can you imagine? Yeah, can you imagine if someone said, like, because we're kind of we bulk record those, and you can you imagine what would happen if someone had booked a episode recording a couple of hours before a massive three episode recording session? <laughs> on the I'm going to see day. you later today, mate. Yeah. <laughs> um, the other podcast I do is Chucky Vision, which is about child's play and the killer doll Chucky, and the current TV show, and again some kind of tangenty stuff. We look at other killer doll films and comic books featuring Chucky and stuff like that that's called chucky vision and um they're at red wolf pod and at chucky vision on twitter and if you s- listen to Le- pick a disc wherever you're listening to pick a disc just search for the podcast names if you want to listen to mine yeah yeah because they, they are on the we made this podcast network that we're uh, yes both fa- both kind of passionate and proud members of um, yes yeah and um, so feel free to go to them so mark it has been three years three years waiting but it's glad to have you finally back on uh finally back on after six months of you apparently trying to pick (laughs) (laughs) i took a while yeah so (laughs) i'm trying to pick but um yeah so three years waiting for this and 30 years waiting to see the wonder stuff again i'm so fucking excited matt (laughs) yeah (laughs) yeah i'm i'm generally kind of excited to excited for you to experience that again so i'm kind of looking forward to hearing how it goes but um Thank you ever so much for coming on. Thank you for having me. It's been a massive pleasure. You've been listening to Pick a Disc and I've been your host, Matthew Layman. Our theme music is Pump by Kevin McLeod of Incompetech.com. Pick a Disc is hosted by the We Made This Podcast Network and you can find them on www.spreaker.com slash user slash We Made This. You can find the Pick a Disc show site on www.spreaker.com slash show slash pick a disc. You can find us on all the usual social media type places like Facebook, Instagram, Twitter under pick a disc. You can also email us on pick a disc at gmail.com. Until next time, happy listening to all those discs that you are picking. Goodbye.